So, thanks for coming, everybody. I'm uh, delighted uh, to introduce Professor Chris Dorset, who is a research fellow at the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies and associate researcher at the Pitt Rivers Museum. Professor Dorset is an artist and academic who has a wide remit of research interest and accomplishments, including work with museums in uh, Nordic countries. I, on your website, I saw something about a train in Nordic countries. Oh, uh, no, trains in England. Oh, trains in, in, trains in Northumberland, actually. Trains in Northumberland, mm. actually. Mm. But uh, museums in Nordic countries, yes. Right, done work yes. There, and Hong Kong and, uh, and indeed the Amazon. And apart from his affiliation here at OCHS, Professor Dorset was Professor of Fine Art at Northumbria University in uh, Newcastle and held appointments at the Edinburgh School of Art, St. Martin's, um, Stockholm, and was head of sculpture here at the Ruskin uh, School of Art. And he's done pioneering exhibitions at the Pitt Rivers Museum, and at OCHS, one of his research projects is on the legacy of the Indian um, art historian, I suppose you call him, art historian, yeah. um, Philip Rawson who many will know from his important book on, on tantric art some years ago. It must be about half a century old now, that yeah, book. Yeah, it is. Mm. He has a long, uh, long list of publications and uh, in prestigious journals and also exhibitions that he's held, which I'll, I, it's all on his website that, that you can look at. So he, Chris has a website, and you can explore the work there, and some of which he presents uh, with short lectures. And I explored it a bit uh, earlier today. <laughs> yeah, it was a fascinating stuff, including um, Titian Tagore Transition, which I enjoyed very much, which was um, an engaging piece, opening with a song of Tagore, sung by um, somebody called Su Suchitra Mitra, who I gather is quite 1950s or 60s, yes. wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, yes, very, uh, very famous yeah, singer. Yeah, mm. very famous singer. Mm. And that transitions into a, a jazz. Mm. Um, Zoe Rahman. Pianist, Zoe Rahman, mm. yeah. Improvisation of the same song, so I enjoyed mm. that very much. And then we've got a couple of others there, Rituals of uh, Refurbishment, Remembering re me Remediating Flip Wilson's Tantra Exhibition, and The World is Breaking Up, a video which is a retelling of a Jataka story, um, The Timid Hare and the Flight of the Beasts. So Chris carries on this work, uh, his work on the Rawson legacy as a project here at OCHS, and I'm delighted to welcome him this afternoon, where he'll give us a presentation entitled, intriguingly, Nine Rooms, Philip Wilson and the Exhibition of Tantra. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you. Oh, for, thank you for your very kind introduction. That's very nice. Um, what I'm going to do, this is t the first lecture. The two lectures go with the J.P. and Bina Kaitan Visiting Fellowship. So this is the first of, of two. Th this first one is a, a written script. I'm going to read it to you because I want, what I want to do is, get, is make sure I survey all the basic points I want to get across in the way that I in the order I want to talk about them. Um, and it is a kind it kind of covers the ground that you've just you've just been des describing. Um, and then the second lecture, which is in seventh week, will look at the. Um, the sort of theoretical background to Philip Rawson's work, especially as it relates to art education and the kind of world that I've made my career in. Um, that's going to be more like a seminar. What I'm going to produce is a, I'll, I'll, I'll make available, probably as slides, um, extracts about um, Indian art or Indian aesthetics drawn from several of the books that he was writing about the time that he... Um, curated the uh, ground-breaking Tantra exhibition at the Haywood Gallery in 1971. So I'll read, if you don't mind. Um, I may pause for breath every now and then. It's, it, as I said, it's, a, it's about 40 minutes long. Um, there's lots of images, so um, there's plenty to look at and listen to. OK. Slide one, it says here. That's one that's up. Um, lecture one, nine rooms, Philip Rawson and the exhibiting of trans of Tantra. If I were to describe Philip Rawson's Tantra exhibition, what comes to mind is a labyrinth of unusually confined spaces. They were very crowded, lots of my contemporaries sitting around on the floor. The year was 1971, 
and the contemporaries I'm talking about were mostly art students. The arrangement of nine coloured rooms confounded my modernist conviction that any exhibit worth seeing required a minimal mode of display. <clears throat> as far as I was concerned, exhibitions require your full attention and nothing should distract you. Much of what I'm going to discuss in this lecture concerns the way those nine rooms challenged my expectations. <clears throat> Let me quickly support this proposition with a bit more background information. It's an art world thing. For as long as I can remember, the dominant aesthetic for displaying new art has undoubtedly been the White Cube Gallery. It's characterised by white walls, top-down light sources and a carefully maintained floor. These characteristics are linked to the development of abstract art, but it's become a, a ubiquitous mode of display in museums as well as art institutions. This one is a refurbished industrial building. White cubes are often like this because urban regeneration schemes favour the creative sector. But even with that interesting Victorian roof, the space is provocatively sterile as it prepares, as it is prepared for its next exhibition. What we see awaits the type of new art that refuses the lens of history. It waits to enclose and define anything that is not yet easy or accessible. The accumulated layers of white emulsion paint only serve to reinforce the emptiness and the eventual presence of art seems almost <clears throat> unnecessary. Here the white cube is an, is an absolute state. It's without content, untenanted, was the word that Brian O'Doherty used when he successfully put a name to this form of gallery experimentation in 1976. His essay, Inside the White Cube, declared the idea over-conventional. Nevertheless, in the months running up to the Tantra to Tantra's opening, the Hayward Gallery was London's leading white cube venue. It had been designed to set the standards for encounters with the latest cutting-edge art. For example, on the left, we see Bridget Riley's paintings on show that summer. The Hayward's luminous cube is nicely captured in, it, in this nighttime image. It must have been photographed from the South Bank Concourse. Through the window, the character of the space is seen first, then the art. Yes, the white cube convention does feel too dominant. The same could be said about Larry Bell's two-way mirror structures, installed in the same space a few months later. They were part of a group exhibition, 11 Los Angeles artists, that ran concurrently with the exhibition this lecture is about. It was in this featureless building that Rawson gathered together hundreds of historical Indian items, sculptures, paintings and sacred objects. It was here he installed small purpose-built spaces and heightened the viewer's sensory engagement with vivid colours, ambient sound and slide projections. I bought this striking red catalogue at the Hayward all those years ago and it's remained an active presence in my studio ever since. Interestingly, I remember that Tantra was widely held to have had greater contemporary resonance than the Californian artists represented by the catalogue on the left. As we can see in the Larry Bell photograph, this show had attentive viewers. They're having fun, but no one's hanging out as they were in Rawson's exhibition. The Arts Council of Great Britain, who commissioned both projects, has material in its archives about the development and reception of these exhibitions. There are lots of documents to sift through, including some complaints about Tantra's cramped viewing spaces. But there are no photographs of the exhibition environment my contemporaries enthused about. So I'm wondering how to picture it for you. You'll need images of some kind. 
And because I've been continually active as an artist since I bought this catalogue 50 years ago, I'm hoping you'll let me represent what I experienced creatively. So let me use these 17th century Barcelli paintings to introduce a plan of the Tantra exhibition photographed in the Arts Council archive. The two pictures are from a Thames and Hudson publication by Rawson. They are perfect examples of the emotional sophistication of Indian art, the appreciation of which he sought to promote in a publishing career that was more extensive and therefore more noticeable than his exhibition making. He wrote about the rich variety of colour combinations which gave each image what he called a special feeling tone. This is a typical Rawson portmanteau term, probably coined in relation to Indian classical music. Feeling tones are, he says, unuttered sensations that resonate within and then heighten our aesthetic pleasure. Unuttered is just what they are. Rawson thought that colours function like sympathetic strings on a sitar. In these two paintings, the feeling tones resonate automatically as the illustrated story is picked out like the modal theme of a melodic raga. Because rooms one and two are marked as deep red and vermilion, what Rawson says about red in these paintings is especially relevant. He was interested in the way that the border gives us a strong emotional lift as our minds cross from everyday reality into the charmed world of the image. This was, I think, how Rawson meant us to enter his labyrinthine installation. Surrounded by this radiant colour, initially darker in tone and then brighter in feel, we move through rooms one and two, encountering material associated with puja which Rawson tells us is the root activity of Indian ceremonial life. As the colour brightens, the sense of liminality expands and the viewer finds ritualised sexual intercourse presented as the gateway to divine ecstasy. Given what I've just described, it's clear that the historical moment in which this exhibition occurred needs contextualisation. The kind of research that Hugh Urban does comes to mind, with titles such as Tantrism, the New Age and the Spiritual Logic of Late Capitalism. Urban's work is the place to look for an overview of our post-60s absorption of tantric ideas. I recognise that this centre will want to correct misrepresentations that have occurred as the West became increasingly permeable to Western Indian philosophy my lecture does involve inaccuracies and clichés. All the same, without knowing anything like enough about what Hindu studies has achieved, I'm here launching into an exploration of Rawson's adaption of what he himself presented as a tantric style of thinking. In part, I'm giving this lecture to establish the terms on which his exhibition could, or more ambitiously should, be defined. You may end up telling me that he misrepresented Tantra, but he did represent something, and perhaps it's this something that still awaits definition. If you agree that the Tantric sage Abhinavagupta applied aesthetic categories to religious sensibilities, then I think I can claim that Rawson reflected this Tantricism back onto Western aesthetics at a key moment in the rise of contemporary art practice. Thus, my deliberations will attempt to make Rawson's reflections on Abhinavagupta a way of describing a complicated art historical moment, crucially at the point when everything was poised on the threshold of postmodernism, Indian aesthetics brought into view the museum environment from which Tantra's exhibits had been drawn. As I scan the planned sequence of rooms, I can just about retrace those special feeling tones Rawson talked about. And it was these shifting moods and recalibrated sensibilities that suggested the particular 
experiments with museums I've pursued as an artist. For example, room three was a purple mulberry colour. Here, artefacts associated with Krishna were displayed, somewhat like that tinted architrave which frames the distant towers at the top of the uppermost painting. A purplish, a purplish hue hung on the air and carried over into the shadowy space beyond. Anticipating this coming darkness, the purple gained in elegance and majesty, a feeling that lingered, then disappeared between the black and smoke-grey walls that followed. Thus, on reaching room four, one reached the cremation ground situated at the edge of town. Until I visited this exhibition, I had no idea so many terrible goddesses resided in museum collections. Everything I saw came either from the V&A Museum, uh, the V&A in London, or Ajit Mukherjee's museum in New Delhi. This was a wake-up call. We care for things in collections and archives, don't we? But what's cared for isn't necessarily passive. Kali is not an acquiescent object of study. These days, in the Pitt Rivers Museum, such considerations have a very contemporary feel. And, my sec and in my second lecture, I'll address some of the post-colonial issues raised by Rawson's collection-based approach. All the same, back at the Hayward Gallery, as quickly as I'd arrived at these muse museological thoughts, I was somewhere else, standing amongst grey, pale green walls, viewing cosmic diagrams of the world. If you've seen the drawings I do now, which began as visual explorations of auditory objects such as gramophone records, you'll appreciate how long it's taken me to work through some of the evocative circular symbols I saw in Room 5. Once again, I'll come back to this in Lecture 2 when I discuss Rawson's books on drawing, some of which date from the time he was curating the Hayward show. Next up was the subtle body, and accordingly, Room 8 was bathed in burnt orange, a manifestation of the creative radiance shaping existence. I remember Richard Lenoy's black and white photographs of tantric yogis taken in Benares in the 1950s. These beautiful prints felt unusually sensual as the orange feeling tone subverted my assumptions about ethnographic witnessing. Then came meditative diagrams displayed in a room coated in untreated Hessian cloth, which felt odd. The logic had been interrupted. Without an optical frame of reference, there was suddenly no radiant surface to interpret. Everything in room seven was haptic, a matter of rough and red, ready materiality. It suggested that if one meditated on a, on a yantra diagram, the all-inclusive substance of fundamental reality would ground you in unprocessed stuff. However, colour did return, and with a great deal of immersive power. In room eight, everything turned an interminable, oh, a sort of indeterminable turquoise blue. Very pale, Rawson wrote on the plan, as he pictured how viewers should approach the ultimate unity at the root of everything. At this point, the exhibition behind us was meant to seem entirely transitory, something like a, a hand of playing cards shuffled and dealt from a single pack. This room led to the full pack, the unitary state, hinted at in images of half-female, half-male deities and diagrams of the world egg always fertile, always subdividing. All of which brought us to room nine, the room representing the stream of energy that imbues everything with being. The space was pure white. I remember there were a uh, salagram of stones mounted along one wall, but these prompts were not really needed. The space itself encouraged you to confront the difficulty 
of imagining what is situated beyond all names and forms. But the exhibition didn't stop. Where I stood opened on to the actual point of resolution. Before me was an entirely different kind of white cube, an empty sound vestibule. In the midst of the Hayward Gallery, Rawson had conjured emptiness from the colourful emotional states that had stacked up one upon the other throughout the preceding exhibition. The journey had been revelatory. My white cube sensibilities were recalibrated as an exquisite sense of exclusion. It was not my place to claim feelings I did not have. And as I made my way out of the installation, I was confronted by the limited knowledge I had of my sensory capacities. I now knew that the modernist white cube was a hindrance because it, the experimentation it encouraged lacked emotional modality. So, just over 50 years ago, as the Tantra exhibition was due to close, I knew I lacked first-hand experience. I had much more to learn. Luckily, the show didn't finish. Popularity kept it open and I continued with my visits. In fact, for me, closure has remained in abeyance. Five decades later, I still want more. We know what became of Tantra in the Western imagination, but the actual reach of this exhibition remains completely unresearched. My best formulations about how art should be made, or at least experimented with, were built upon what the Tantra experience suggested I should do with my sensibilities as an artist. Thanks to Rawson, I now thought this would involve museums as well as contemporary art. But as I look back, there are no parallel avenues of research to complement my development. What so surprises me is that there's no secondary literature. Publications come and go, I read things about Tantra, and indeed about exhibition practices, but Rawson is never mentioned. This silence prompts questions. Why is there a lack of interest? After all, there's plenty of reading matter in the archive. We can try to formulate some answers today, but an academic debate may not get us very far. In a book review of 1964, Rawson disdained a merely intellectual engagement with Indian aesthetics, aesthetic theory. Much more was needed. Western audiences, he said, lacked appropriate emotive responses. Thus, exhibition making was his preferred vehicle. It would take a predominantly aesthetic medium to make feeling tones publicly obtainable. And Tantra was Rawson's most ambitious attempt at moving beyond what he took to be our cultural limitations. Each room in the exhibition had its own immersive sensuality, based on the sensory triggers that Abhinav Gupta associated with core emotional states. Rawson used colour, but he also used the viewer's time. The time it took to see the show was for him an aesthetic medium in its own right. The tantric exhibits were encountered, as you've seen, in passageways and lobbies, and each of these spaces made a new level of emotional awareness available, what Abhinav Gupta called a rasa. If each move you made felt special, it, then it was your accumulating awareness of these rasas that generated your numinous state, an idea that would have been familiar to anyone who'd encountered Rawson's books. But even if you hadn't read anything he'd written, moving through these spaces <coughs> would have evoked the performative power of a happening, the type of experimental art experience that had become fashionable in the 1960s. Numinous or not, this was the zeitgeist. The Arts Council archive contains evidence that the show became more popular than they anticipated. There were features in new journals like Yoga and Health, interest from men's magazines such as Nave, and references to the support of John Lennon, George Harrison and Mick Jagger. This was its popularist dimension. But the show 
with its immersive environment, sound room and slide tape displays also anticipated contemporary media art. Like me, the critics treated all this as cutting edge. No one was yet using the term installation art, but in the air was the possibility that entire interiors could be designated artworks. Tantra was exactly that. And, crit and the critics noted that crowds of art students were gathering every day to engage with this pioneering piece of exhibition making. Whatever happened to all these young artists, whatever all these young artists went on to do, they now have a lifetime of experience behind them. Furthermore, because the success of Tantra propelled Rawson into a new career teaching at the Royal College of Art, it's not difficult to find established artists and artist educators who were taught by him. I'm one. Through the Royal College, I befriended Rawson and was guided by him in the early stages of my career. Consequently, my museum work is part of the ongoing impact of the exhibition. The generation of arts practitioners to which I belong thought Tantra was a transformative experience. After that, we no longer assumed that the future was white cube exhibiting. This was, for me, an early step towards treating art as a socially embedded practice. Similarities between the highly packed layout of the Tantra exhibition and the Pitt Rivers Museum were not lost on me when I arrived in Oxford to become the Ruskin School of Art's first head of sculpture. If Tantra's radical approach was photographically unavailable to my students, I could instead send them to this museum. Indeed, they could go there and imagine site-specific inter interventions as I was beginning to do myself. And as our imaginings became more adventurous, the process enlarged my, my sense of what a museum could do. Things moved quickly. I was soon organising actual exhibitions and other museums were inviting me to do the same. I documented everything that happened and used the accumulating archive of 35 millimetre slides to pitch ideas to other artists. Every intervention was temporary, so you could say that these sheets of slides became the project itself. Today, in this lecture, they have a d another job to do. They're going to illustrate my tantric refusal of white cube exhibiting. <coughs> Alongside this, they will also demonstrate the interpretive reach of the museum-based audience I created. This slide shows the Pitt Rivers display case labelled Religious Figures Asia. It's where most of the Hindu deities reside. Imagine spending time looking at this case. Imagine the time it takes to respond to the multitudinous presence of all these figures. You'll wonder if it's possible to understand what you say, what you see. But then again, for the sensitive museum visitor, there is something insightful about not knowing. This is what I referred to earlier as an exquisite sense of exclusion. Nothing could be further from the modernist convention. In the Pitt Rivers, you are repeatedly distracted. But these distractions have their own resonance. They also function like a sitar's sympathetic strings. Case by case, as you move about the museum, associations abound as the quantity of exhibits you see expands. Here are trumpets from Tibet, over there offering bowls from Nigeria, and then turning your attention to the models of ships and boats, you see families exploring the museum too. This is where you encounter levels of enchantment ra rarely found in art galleries. For example, on an early visit, I saw a baby carried around in a papoose. I thought it the most graceful exhibition going I'd ever seen. The tiny child hovered amidst the sheets of reflective plate glass, apparently absorbing everything. This was not the fullness of interpretation expected of an adult viewer. Rather, 
it was the pre-interpretive state in which aesthetic sensibilities form. That's why I made the little angel on the left. I'm not one of those sculptors who knows in advance how a new piece will be exhibited. Therefore, at one end of 20 feet of forged aluminium rod, I went in search of a place in the Pitt Rivers for the small figure I'd made. I'd seen medieval sculptures fixed to the interior of a Bavarian church by brackets of such length that their, that their suspended state looked like magic. So I moved around the cases until a place was found. Like a museum visitor absorbing everything around me, I accepted the meaning of the piece as the product of a chance juxtaposition. It was the tiny people in the model boat at the top of the case that acknowledged and welcomed its presence. Thus, the success of the piece was its placement, and I do still find it successful. Like something dreamed up by Duns Scotus and the medieval schoolmen, the positioning of an angel in this corporal setting seemed to both unsettle and charm those who came across it. Out of all the museum pieces I've made, this is the one I usually show people. It sums up what I do. The angel was carved out of lime wood. It's a northern European tradition famously explored by Michael Baxendon in his book about sculptural practices in Renaissance Germany. He made it easy to understand how the visual aesthetic associated with this medium is no longer available to us. It's not the way we see things. It's alien to the contemporary eye. And yet the Pitt Rivers gave my version of this carving tradition unexpected contemporaneity. The angel was well received. In this setting, an anachronism can refuse the lens of history. This is the paradox. This was the paradox of the Tantra exhibition. It's kept me working in museums. I want to bring alternative sensibilities into play. Heightened feeling tones are not, I suggest, confirmed by consensus. Accordingly, each time I put a show together with my main collaborator, the museum's ethnomusicologist, Hélène Leroux, new levels of what Jacques Roncier calls dissensus were achieved. For example, in the centre, you see Phila de Barlow's airfix model of a Harrier jump jet bound in a mile of sellotape. This was a high-profile transgression, as was the word beggar man on the right. Shooter Babizwas had projected Tinker Taylor, the children's counting rhyme, onto the sail of the outrigger canoe. The non-arrival of the final word, thief, challenged a basic premise of anthropological collecting. Such subversions were reflected in the exhibition titles we were starting to use. Upturned Ark in 1990, Snares of Privacy and Fiction in 1992, then, in 1994, Divers' Memories. Divers being an archaic way of saying many and different. But this last title was deliberately ambiguous. We were associating the museum's distinctive maze of Victorian plate glass with Godden and Badley's famous underwater memory experiment. Apparently, divers who, did, who had memorised lists of words on the seabed improved their ability to recall what they'd learnt by returning underwater. The Pit Rivers did this to artists. Our exhibitions, which were becoming more and more inclusive, were a form of collective cultural remembering. At this time, I was also transferring the idea to Stockholm and began to make something comparable happen in Sweden. I started in the City Museum and then moved on to Livrus Cameron, the Royal Swedish Armoury, and Halvilska Palace, the historic home of, a, of an aristocratic family. The 20 artists who participated made two-part works that could only be viewed by visiting two museums. Our methods were becoming increasingly inventive, and when I took my expanding archive of images to Finland, the experimental nature of divers' memories 
generated a large-scale project in a collection of historic buildings on the Russian border. The size of this open-air museum, which is like a small town, expanded participation to 122 exhibitors, who range from artists with international profiles to local school pupils. My unconventional role as a curator had reached its peak. No selection process was necessary. Most of the contributors heard about the exhibition by word of mouth. Next, a parallel opportunity occurred at a heritage site near the Chinese border in the New Territories of Hong Kong. The handover had happened the year before and I was invited to work in a walled village ex exhibiting new works by Chinese and UK artists. The environment was certainly very historical, but it wasn't a museum. People lived there and Feng Shui figured constantly when site-specific pieces were proposed. Consequently, our approach became increasingly activist. My research assistant, the artist Vivian Ho, collected stories from villagers and recorded them on mothballs. Packets of them were sold in the local shop and you could use them, as everybody did, to ward off hungry insects. However, once the packets were open, the stories evaporated, as the publicity flyer on the right illustrates. The curator, Nicola Burio, calls activities like this relational aesthetics. It's where the art resides in the social interaction, not the exhibit. Which leads me to another project, one that grew out of a residency in the Amazon field station, in an Amazonian field station. I called it Trees Walking because trees and walking were the central preoccupation of bo botanists working on rainforest flora. Day after day, hour after hour, they walked and looked at trees. It was hard work shadowing them in the tropical heat. When I got back to the UK, I published a guide to the walking stick collection at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. They have hundreds of them, all catalogued as ethnobotanical artefacts. Certainly many are beautifully crafted things, but others are just sticks, sticks that were picked up when needed. So I installed signs along a curated walk and wrote the information in an invented stick language using twig drawings I'd done in the Amazon. The botanists were perplexed. And I've no wish to tidy up such reactions. Not everything I've done has required conventional acts of communication. It was the cultivation of emotive responses, not master narratives, that licensed all sorts of engagements with all sorts of museum things. And a single presentation like this cannot represent what's documented in my 400 slide archive. This wide ranging body of documentation, which the Pitt Rivers now has accessioned, is the best map to the path that Tantra guided me along. As Rawson hoped, the encounter with what he called Sanskrit aesthetics had opened up avenues of investigation within the conceptual systems of my own contemporary culture. All the same, nothing I've shown you actually resembles his exhibition. The path I've been describing has been a creative one, and the spectrum of references available to me has been wide. You may find the connections I'm making counterintuitive, but in this very room, Mikhail Akhtar has described the worship of pillars and stones as a form of an iconism. Iconicity, the theory of likeness developed by Charles Sanders Peirce, entails its dissential opposite. That which is an iconic has the presence but not the similitude. Thus, as an artist, my secular world teems with possible surrogacies, with things that can be made to stand in for other things, like Rawson's catalogue. Here's that splendid surrogate again, alongside two aniconic products of its presence in my studio. This copy was inscribed by the author. It's the one Rawson kept in his office at Durham Oriental Museum. It's full of markings related to the Thames and Hudson Tantra book he published a year later. 
I often pick it up and notice new things. For example, the involvement of David Medella, for me, a key installation artist in the 1970s. He loaned his personal collection of sacred objects to the exhibition, which is in itself an indication of the avant-garde status of Rawson's project. But I already knew this. I remember that many of the students who gathered at the Hayward Gallery also gathered at Medalla's Eskimo Carver exhibition a few years later. Because on this occasion they were asked to make their own exhibits, the writer Guy Brett called what happened a participation production piece. It's a defining moment in the development of social art practices in the UK. According to Inuit traditions, knives sing songs and because creating songs is a communal process making knives communally was an evocative way of dedicating a contemporary art exhibition to Inuit culture. Knife-like items were aniconically improvised out of scrap, ma scrap materials and impromptu labels were inscribed on the gallery wall as each exhibit was displayed. Because I was there I think I know what many of these young artists did next. They took the participation production idea forward in projects like Divers Memories. Long before the art critic Susie Gablick published The Reenchantment of Art, we wanted an aesthetic enchantment that went further than the modernist white cube. So maybe those nine rooms in Rawson's Tantra exhibition and not as under-researched as I claim. Perhaps my career has been an extended re-enchantment of the original idea. Interventions like my Pit Rivers Angel offer an account of this practice-based process. Nevertheless, I'm bound to think that Rawson should receive greater attention. More people could engage with his legacy, not just me. Why doesn't this happen? Well, the Centre's Artists in Residence Scheme, which I now look after, will be a good way of finding some answers. Of course, there's no way of repeating an unrepeatable exhibition, but the presence of contemporary practitioners in this Hindu studies environment is surely enough. Many of the artists who will apply will also have academic posts in art schools. Through them, the Centre will reach future generations. Rawson would approve. In a 1968 article for Studio International, he applauded the discovery of Tantra by art students in Britain and America. In our wide awake art schools, he wrote, those prepared to open their eyes are adopting new ways of seeing. Consequently, my second lecture will explore Rawson's wider engagement with art education in the winter months of 1971, as the Hayward Gallery was beginning, was hosting Tantra, he was starting to teach. And the aesthetic speculations of Abhinavagupta were about to become the concern of radical art practices. So that's Nine Rooms, Philip Rawson and the Exhibiting of Tantra. And these are the publications I've referred to. Thank you.